This video continues the story of the 1673 expedition of Marquette and Joliet to reach the Mississippi and determine where it emptied. The script is mainly composed of selected and condensed quotations from the story or receipt written by Father Claude de Blanc and sent as part of his annual report to Paris. The previous video, Marquette and Joliet 1, covered the start of the trip, which began at St. Ignace at the Straits of Mackinac, traveled west across Lake Michigan, then down Green Bay to the Fox River, and then up the Fox to the Portage to the Wisconsin, which then carried them southwest to the Mississippi, where, Marquette says, we arrived at the mouth of our river, and at 42 and a half degrees of latitude, we safely entered Mississippi on the 17th of June with a joy that I cannot express. Marquette then continues, Here we are then, on this so renowned river, which Marquette named the Conception in honor of his devotion to Mary. Its current, which flows southward, is slow and gentle. We gently followed its course as far as the 42nd degree of latitude. Here we plainly saw that its aspect was completely changed. There are hardly any woods or mountains. Marquette here notes the beginning of the prairie, the vast grasslands of North America. Finally, on the 25th of June, we perceived on the water's edge some tracks of men and a narrow and somewhat beaten path leading to a fine prairie. We silently followed the narrow path, and after walking about two leagues, five miles, we discovered a village named Peoria on the map, on the bank of a river. We therefore decided that it was time to reveal ourselves. This we did by shouting with all our energy and stopped without advancing any farther. On hearing the shout, the Indians quickly issued from their cabins. I therefore spoke to them first and asked them who they were. They replied that they were Illinois, and as a token of peace, they offered us their pipes to smoke. These pipes for smoking tobacco are called in this country calumets. When we reached the village of the great captain, we saw him at the entrance of his cabin between two old men, all three standing naked and holding their calumet turned toward the sun. Seeing all assembled in silence, I told them that we were journeying peacefully to visit the nations dwelling on the river as far as the sea. When I had finished my speech, the captain arose, and resting his hand upon the head of a little slave whom he wished to give us, he spoke thus, I thank you, Black Robe, and you, O Frenchman, addressing Monsieur Joliet, for having taken so much trouble to come to visit us. Never has the earth been so beautiful or the sun so bright as today. Never has our river been so calm or so clear of rocks, which your canoes have removed as they traveled. Never has our tobacco tasted so good or, or our corn appeared so fine as we now see them. Here is my son, whom I give you so that you will know my heart. I beg you to have pity on me and on all of my nation." It is you who know the great spirit who has made us all. It is you who speak to him and who hear his words. Beg him to give me life and health and to come and dwell with us in order to make us know him. Having said this, he placed the little slave beside us. Gifts of slaves were elements of diplomacy for the Illinois and other nations. And he gave us a second present in the form of a very mysterious calumet upon which they place more value than upon a slave. And he begged us on behalf of all his nation not to go farther on account of the great dangers to which we would expose ourselves. We slept in the captain's cabin, and on the following day we took leave of our Illinois at the end of June, about three o'clock in the afternoon. As we were gliding along peacefully through the clear, calm water, we heard the noise of a rapid into which we were about to run. I have never seen anything so dreadful. An accumulation of large and entire trees, branches, and floating islands was issuing from the mouth of the river Pecatanui with such impetuosity that we could not, without great danger, 
risk passing through it. So great was the agitation that the water was very muddy and could not become clear. This was the Missouri River. We descended almost always in a southerly direction until we reached 33 degrees latitude, where we perceived a village at the water's edge called Michigamia. We had recourse to our patroness and guide, the Blessed Virgin Immaculate, whose assistance we certainly needed, for in the distance we could hear the Indians shouting continually to prepare themselves for combat. Armed with bows, arrows, hatchets, clubs, and shields, they made ready to attack us on both land and water. Some of them embarked in great wooden canoes, one party going upriver, the other downriver, in order to intercept us and surround us on all sides. Those who were on land went back and forth as if to open the attack. In fact, some young men plunged into the water to come and seize my canoe, but the current forced them to return to land. One of them hurled his club, which passed over our heads without striking us. In vain I showed the calumet and made them signs that we were not coming to make war. The alarm continued, and they were already preparing to pierce us with arrows from all sides, when God suddenly touched the hearts of the old men who were standing at the water's edge. No doubt this event came about through the sight of our calumet. They had not recognized it from a distance, but as I continued to display it, it finally had an effect, and they checked the ardor of their young men. We informed them that we were going to the sea. We obtained no other answer than that we would learn all that we desired at another large village called Acampsio, which was only eight to ten leagues, twenty-five miles farther down. When we arrived within half a league, a little more than one mile, of the Acampsia, we saw two canoes coming to meet us. He who commanded stood upright, holding in his hand the calumet, with which he made various signs, according to the custom of the country. He joined us, singing very agreeably, and gave us tobacco to smoke. We afterward asked them what they knew about the sea. They replied that we were only ten days' journey from it. They also told us that, moreover, we exposed ourselves to great dangers by going farther. Monsieur Joliet and I held another council to deliberate upon what we should do, whether we should push on or remain content with the discovery which we had made. After attentively considering that we were not far from the Gulf of Mexico, and that beyond a doubt the Mississippi River discharges into the Florida or Mexican Gulf, we further considered that we exposed ourselves to the risk of losing the results of this voyage if we proceeded to fling ourselves into the hands of the Spaniards. All these reasons induced us to decide upon returning. And so we start on the 17th of July from the village of the Akensia to retrace our steps. We therefore reascend the Mississippi, which gives us much trouble in breasting its currents. It is true that we leave it at about the 38th degree to enter another river, the Illinois, which greatly shortens our road, and takes us with but little effort to the lake of the Illinois, Lake Michigan. We found on the Illinois River a village of Illinois called Kaskaskia, consisting of 74 cabins. They received us very well and obliged me to promise that I would return to instruct them. One of the chiefs of this nation, with his young men, escorted us to the Lake of the Illinois via the Chicago Portage, whence at last, at the end of September, we reached the Bay des Pouillons, from which we had started at the beginning of June. This ends the account of the Mississippi Expedition in Chapter 1 of the Receipt. Marquette remained at the St. Francis Xavier Mission in Green Bay, while Joliet returned to his fur trading post at Sault Ste. Marie with the young slave they received at the Peoria village. By then it was October and too late in the year for him to travel to Quebec to make his report to Frontenac, the governor. That would have to wait until next summer, as would Marquette's hope of returning to the Illinois to establish a mission. Meanwhile, both Marquette and Joliet would have time to write their accounts 
and make their maps of the expedition.